our approach to supporting the industry, highlight the relevant regulation, and then have a Q&A session so that we could hear and support all of the questions that you may have. Next, Sylvie will walk you through some helpful statistics and explain how this focus really hits home for her. Thank you, Megan. Um, so my name is Sylvie Steckenberg. For those who do, do, do not know me, I am the Provincial First Services Manager in Prince George, uh, but I'm also the Manager of Interest for the manufacturing sector and uh, work with uh, very uh, smart and engaged uh, officers uh, through the province uh, that do manufacturing inspections and will go in your side to do that specific initiative. So, um, as you can see um, in the sawmill uh, CU, um, thank you, transportation <laughs> unit. Um, when we look at serious injury rate, uh, we started at 0 0.44 um, for uh, the sawmill industry, which is higher than the provincial average. I just want to. Uh, this is why you were part of the 2018-2020 uh, manufacturing high-risk strategy. Uh, but what we see is the train, train, even though we went on your site and looked at different risk, which was nine focus risk, um, we didn't have the impact that we thought this would have. So we went from 44 to last year, uh, 2020, sorry, because 2021, uh, we're still waiting for the final data. Uh, we finished at 0.51. Um, so we, we really tried to understand uh, why this um, this uh, was happening. As you can see, this is very small and I apologize for this. Um, but what we looked at the data in the manufacturing sector, not specifically uh, sawmill at this point, um, cutting, cut in, uh, by machinery and struck by machinery is still the source number one of serious injury in the sector. We present about 30% of those injuries. Um, sawmill is the number CU, uh, if we go deep dive into that, that uh, will have those type of injuries, about eight to 10% of uh, those total injuries. When we deep dive to that, I said, well, you know, we've been looking at safeguarding and lockout for quite a while. Uh, so what is going on in here? So we went to the detailed data and what we were, we saw is 44% of your injuries are related to live equipment um, when we work around live equipment. So that's what narrowed down to that initiative. Now, there is other sources, I'm sure mobile equipment struck by uh, to pedestrians and businesses uh, talking to you as well. Uh, and um, there is also other type of injury that we could see uh, going in and out of vehicles, slips, trips and falls. So those are also uh, in the top uh, source of injuries for that type of, for, for that bucket of, a, of source of injuries. Now, this is not, unfortunately, this is not a surprise. Um, my background is I work in manufacturing for the last 20 years. And um, I've been part of fatality investigation, service injury fatal fatality uh, worldwide team. And I would say that 95% of the service injury and fatality that I had to assist uh, were involving working with live equipment. Um, one of my my locker neighbor at one one of the facility I was working passed away exactly for similar injury as well. This has a tremendous impact on the family of the worker community uh, and the local community itself. And uh, I know everybody online here has all to make the right thing to make the workplace safer. So I'm sure when we talk about those injuries, and we talked about in the past 36 months of 121 or 24 injuries in sawmills related to uh, 
those type of injuries. Um, so that means one in 121 families, workplaces, local community, and workplace community directly impacted by those type of injuries in BC. Um, and in sawmills. So I'm sure that uh, one thing that really um, hit me and it was always like very difficult to go through it's hearing uh, the general, general manager expressing the, the, the awful experience that it was to go to the funeral of a worker and have to say condolences to the spouse and the children. Um, also, the amount of pressure on the supervision, direct supervision of those workers uh, that have to go through not only the loss and the stress, and we all have feel guilt when those things happen, but also the pressure of the investigation process. Uh, most of the supervisor will not return to work for at least a year following an injury like this. Um, the co-workers, very difficult for co-workers as well. And uh, some co-worker has to move department or even leave the company because cannot just see the workplaces anymore. And I can relate to that because my locker neighbor, as I said, that passed away, the equipment that uh she got injured um every time i walk through a similar equipment i still have goosebumps today and it's been 10 years uh in a couple of weeks it will be 10 years so um this is not about a paper cup and this is not about a small injury we're talking about amputation we're talking about compound fractures uh and we're looking at uh, fatality as well in those type of injuries so I just wanted to put the why uh, we are focusing on that type of injury, because that's where you have your main core of injuries in your industry. So our objective is really working with all of you about reducing those serious injury and uh, related to cleaning, troubleshooting, and performing maintenance uh, work with energized equipment and increase your effectiveness of controls. The main risk focus is when a uh, worker are cutting or struck by uh, equipment during cleaning, troubleshooting, maintenance work on energized equipment. Uh, when we look at your data, we saw that there was an improvement about those type of injuries um, for normal operations. But one thing that didn't change and actually increase uh, on the ratio was these type of these type of tasks. So um, as I mentioned, 32% in the manufacturing sector in the past 36 months, this represents 787 serious injury. Uh, they've been part of our manufacturing harvest strategy, but we were focusing mainly on normal operation and not uh, with upset condition. Um, so, and that's really what's uh, highlighted in your claims data is that uh, situation of the conditions, uh, it's still unresolved. So we want to work with the salmon industry to help them to control the risk. And I wanna make sure everybody understand that, you know, I've been in manufacturing sector. I know we cannot eliminate all the tasks uh, uh, that in some of them will require energized work. Um, it's more about in these types of tasks, what can we do? And how can we ensure we are doing our due diligence and we are mitigating the risk on an effective way? As I mentioned, uh, 121 claims was related to those type of injury, and which represent about 8 to 10 percent of the total injuries, and 44 percent of them were really directly of cleaning, troubleshooting, and cleaning maintenance tasks with energized equipment. So what are we expecting from, uh, you know, for critical controls? What, what can we do, basically? Um, obviously, safeguarding a lockout inspection uh, focused more on traditional lockout situation during normal operation. There is circumstances where energized equipment is required. You're going to think about tracking a conveyor belt on uh, a, a belt conveyors or packing a pump or 
uh, things like that sometimes that require energized work. It is paramount that an employer can demonstrate why can you cannot be done, uh, totally lockout, what needs to be energized, and when it is required, um, and energy source, sorry, energy sources require. And then when you have that, you can do a risk assessment of the tasks that needs to be done and develop your procedures to make sure that the worker has clear guidance that those work can be done safely. Now there is, um, and I'm sure you're, I'm gonna, I cannot see your camera, but I'm sure I would see a little smiles uh, with that, uh, you know, that statement I'm gonna say. A lot of the maintenance work uh, that are done by our trades, uh, there is that belief that because they have a red seal, they've been trained prof you know, professionally through the trade schools, that they are trained, therefore they are competent to do the job and to do those life uh, uh, energy jobs. I also work with uh, education um, facilities and I work with uh, directly with Dean for the trade schools. When you talk to them, they say, yeah, I'll, I'll teach them how to do a task, but each task and equipment will evolve in different environment and it's still the employer responsibility that uh, they have procedures to mitigate the overall risk of that environment. Saying that, you can have, and I'm going to take my example again of that conveyor belt. Yes, the, the, the millwright will know how to track the belt. However, your conveyors could be in proximity of transfer table chutes um, and um, other type of uh, equipment that could create other risk than just tracking the belt. And that's what we're looking at as well. So it's very important that you are able to identify which tasks are requiring to remove the safeguard and need to be uh, again troubleshoot, clean, or maintain, maintaining equipment. Once you have those one is, do we need energy? And if we do, uh, what energy sources would be required to complete that task? Um, when you have that, now that list of Excuse me. When you have that list of tasks, then you can do risk assessment uh, to develop your safe work procedures and make sure you train uh, your workers on those procedures and ensure competency assessment. Also, authorization process is required under the regulation for the worker to complete energized uh, work. And monitoring and supervision is your key for due diligence purposes as well. Okay. Uh, what we're really looking at from this initiative is to help each employer in the industry to increase the effectiveness of the controls that they currently have with uh, work requiring, requiring energized equipment. Um, Obviously, we want to reduce the number of serious injury claims related to those type of injuries. Um, that's the overall goal to ensure that each worker can go home safely and reducing the awful impact that it has in the workplaces and uh, family and the working com community. And when I say working community, just uh, Last Christmas in my region, there was a construction worker that passed away from a CO2 exposure. It affected the full construction local community. And we had several webinars to discuss that with that industries. Um, but you can see still today when we go for inspection, it's still a very sore topic because every feel, everybody feel so uh, sad for losing one of their uh, counterparts. Uh, in our community. Next slide, please. I'll, I'll pass it to Megan for that part. Is Megan there? Here, there, uh, sorry. Sylvie, there is a question in the chat about uh, the statistics of mobile equipment. I see this. that. Okay. The statistic, um, 
Yeah, it is struck by injuries. So it could be struck by projectiles, so a process material, uh, you know, coming out of the equipment uh, will be uh, one of them. Um, we didn't include the struck by mobile equipment, so they're not part of it. Obviously, when we look at the overall injuries, they are the number, the second cause of your injuries. So we said 44%. And then after that, the next, uh, you know, the next one that have the highest percentage is the mobile equipment. I know the MAG group and the manufacturer, manufacturing um, technical advisory group uh, is working with a collaboration to do both our analysis so we can provide some uh, good information and critical controls around that as well for this this year. Uh, our inspection will not specifically focus on that, but definitely if there's something Congress we will discuss that with the specific uh, employer. Megan, to you. So uh, my department largely focuses on consultation and education services. Uh, so I'll cover the part on awareness, consultation, and education. For awareness, what we're trying to do is get the approach um, for reducing serious injury claims related to cotton and struck by and sawmills related to cleaning, troubleshooting, and maintaining equipment in an energized state known to the larger audience. We want to work in consultation with industry, um, give them an opportunity to look deeper into the issue, and then see how um, sawmills can improve the practices that they currently have in place. As far as education, we're currently working on creating some tools. So um, Sylvie will talk about the inspectional initiative, but really we're developing the tools as we're starting the inspectional approach. And our intent is to share what we've learned um, and help uh, present what proactive controls might look like in industry once we learn from this. Sylvie, can I get you to explain a little bit more about the details with the inspection approach? Yes, so what can you expect from our officers? Um, so the first, uh, the first quarter of the year, so until uh, March, um, sorry about that, uh, which is this month, at the end of this month, I think it will extend a little bit in the second quarter, but you're gonna see officers to go on your site and really have that education piece in, um, um, really spend time to communicate with the employer, uh, with your judge committee or the worker representative uh, to uh, help you to understand what is the risk, what is your current level of effectiveness, and what controls, uh, you know, what we are looking at to mitigate those type of risk. The officers will also come in the end of the year, and the idea is to reassess how effectively you have made changes and enable the change in your workplace. What we really want to see is having your you and your judge committee or working in collaboration with your worker rep to uh, identify the task and already have action plan uh, in process to improve uh, your controls or improve, increase the effectiveness of your controls uh, related to this task. Um, obviously, if we see an high risk situation uh, during the first inspections, uh, this would be addressed with the employer, uh, but really the main intent of the first inspection is to educate and the second one is to do field validation. Uh, Brock, you want to add uh, to that as you're the officer, so you might want to just uh, say what you're seeing up there so far. Yeah, for sure. Um, so typically, what we're what I mean, I what I've been doing is educating the the employer, like you said, incorporating the Joint Health and Safety Committee or worker rep um, in energized equipment. As for, and uh, other strategies as well. Um, we have been going through, kind of working through with employers and the health and safety committees on the hierarchy of controls um, as far as energized work equipment goes and other hazards in their workplace as well. Um, it's very much a consultative uh, inspection at that point, like you were saying, uh, education. Um, so far, what I've been seeing is that um, most of the employers that I've gone to um, have just eliminated working on energized equipment altogether. Thank you, Brock. 
And is the response of the employer about the consultation indication as been positive? Yeah, for sure. I have very lot they appreciate the the education piece um, about the strategy um, as a whole, and then the working on energized equipment piece, um, so that they can maybe go back and uh, review the procedures they have, or or even the the processes they have um, prior to us just coming in and, and saying, hey, this is what I'm looking for today. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And the uh, tools that we are developing, uh, the officer will probably share during inspection so you can see it. I know, Brock, you do it. Uh, so, uh, and we're still refine, like, do fine tuning on those tools, and but we will be sharing those tools with you uh, during the inspection so you can have access to the information as well. Uh, the regulation that uh, we refer uh, on those inspections is the OHNS regulation 10.12. Uh, which is work on energized equipment. So this is just a reminder for everybody. So what is that regulation? So when not practicable, and I say there is a situation where it is not practicable uh, to shut down a machinery or equipment for maintenance unless parts uh, which are vital to the process may remain energized and the work must be performed by worker who are qualified to do the work, have been authorized by the employer to do the work and have been provided with uh, uh, with and follow written safe work procedures. So you can see how that fits in the overall critical controls that we've seen earlier is determine, have a determination process to why this cannot be practicable and uh, what is your process to develop your safe procedure and keep only what's vital to be energized during that work. So when we talk about maintenance, so the definition of maintenance work is any work that's performed to keep machinery or equipment in a safe operation condition, including installing, repairing, cleaning, so obstructing material uh, or cleaning the equipment, lubricating, and the clearing of obstruction of the normal flow of material. So that is your um, uh, definition of maintenance work. So next slide, please. So what we ask each of you, so you can start the process before the officer is uh, uh, going to your workplace, but basically what we ask uh, you know, workplaces is to involve your judge committee or your worker rep to notify activity in your workplace that involve that type uh, of uh, uh, work, uh, uh, work on energized equipment during the cleaning, troubleshooting and maintenance. Um, assess your current control, see what you have currently, because well, I'm sure there's good things that's happening as well. Um, and I'd find the gaps with the critical controls and the regulation requirements and develop and implement your action plan. Uh, celebrate your success with your judge community, because this is also success to see if you are reducing your uh, injury related to uh, live equipment in your workplace. And it should be a good feeling that, and you should celebrate the success with uh, your workers. Megan, you'd like to add anything to this? Sorry about that. Took me a while to navigate and get back. Um, I think um, we're probably ready for some questions and answers if there's um, any out there. Um, if we could take a look at the chat, see if anyone wants to raise their hand at this point in time. We have a lot of attendees here. If there's anything specific that you're interested in knowing, um, both Sylvie, Brock, and I would be more than happy to answer those now. There's a couple of questions from Dave Murray in the chat. One you've already addressed, but maybe not. Yeah, so I think that was the same questions, those two questions. So as I said, mobile equipment, uh, not part of 44%, but part of the overall percentage. Um, and yes, projectiles from the process material on the equipment would be one of the statistics uh, in the protocol. Oh, 
Okay. Well, our contact information is posted there and I've provided our prevention line as well as my personal contact. Um, if you wanna chat with me, um, my department does not focus on um, enforcement activities. We just um, do consultation and education. So if you have any questions in particular, just want someone to chat with, um, be pointed to um, resources, that sort of thing, I'm happy to help. Otherwise, your local officer is always more than happy to uh, support you with any of those inquiries as well. And I think BC yeah. Forest Safety Council is a great resource as well, should any questions come up or if industry wants to work together to um, try to develop some specific best practices in this area. We have one more question. Will you be sharing the presentation? I guess we can send it to Bill uh, on the PDF. Yes, we can send it in a PDF format. It's Bill here, as well as the presentation. We'll also have a recording of the um, the meeting today for participants or for people that uh, weren't able to participate. So it sounds like there's no more questions. So I'd like to thank um, I'd like to thank everyone for showing up and uh, participating in this. And I'd like to thank uh, Megan, Sylvie, and Brock uh, for uh, their information. It, uh, I think it helps everybody, including the industry, to, uh, uh, to, to know what's happening or what's going to happen when an officer comes onto their site. So uh, thank you very much for your time and, and efforts in this. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Thanks. Appreciate your time.